Uh, good evening. It's eight o'clock, and welcome to today's episode of Marvelous you. Medicine. During the course of our hundredth episode, uh, uh, Professor Nandi specifically said that uh, we are playing it very safe and talking only about uh, science and not uh, venturing into controversial areas. So uh, we hope to start a series where we can discuss and debate about what ails uh, medical education in India and how uh, moving forward we can bring some changes and. Uh, so today's will be like a curtain raiser. Actually, uh, Ilango has been doing some work on uh, trying to help uh, fresh graduates, and that's how this uh, topic came about. But uh, once we started uh, discussing things with Ilango, we realized that uh, we are on to a good thing, and uh, we should actually build a series around it. So you could consider today to be the uh, first part of the series. So today's topic is rethinking undergraduate medical education. Those uh, who are Participants in marvelous medicine and those who belong to learning general surgery don't need an introduction to Dr. Ilango Setu, but for formality's sake, I will do that. He's a senior consultant, liver and renal transplant surgery, hepatobiliary and pancreatic surgery, and lead surgeon of high-risk pancreas diseases in uh, MIOT International Hospital in Chennai. Uh, Ilango did his MBBS from Madurai Medical College, MS General Surgery from Trivandrum Medical College, and his MCH Surgical Gastroenterology from Madras Medical College. He then went on to do his uh, fellowship in multi-organ transplant at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. Lango has several innovations to his credit in the man management of acute pancreatitis, liver and kidney transplantation, hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery, vascular surgery. As you can see, his interests are wide-ranging, and he also led the uh, MIOTs fight against COVID from the front and made surgery safe during COVID. Teaching is his passion, and instead of just teaching juniors in his specialty, he has reached out to help fresh med medical graduates and junior doctors struggling at the beginning of their careers. Today, we are going to listen to his uh, journey with them. Moderating the session will be Dr. Amit Kumar Ghosh. He started off the Marvelous Medicine series by delivering a lecture on pedagogy in medicine, which uh, served as a benchmark for future uh, speakers to how to be on time and how to have a good discussion after the talk. Amit has been a supporter of Marvelous Medicine over the past two years. He's a consultant Department of Medicine, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, and Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. Amit was my batchmate and is, did his MBBS from Jipma Pondicherry, MD General Medicine, and Fellowship in Nephrology from PGI Chandigarh. After moving to the United States, he completed his residency in Internal Medicine and Fellowship in Nephrology and Hypertension from the University of Minnesota. Amit has an MBA from the Augsburg University and is a certified physician executive. He has several publications in high impact journals and is a sought after speaker at national and international fora. Makes it a point to attend most of the Association of Physicians of India uh, meeting and he will be there this year too. He has received several awards for his work in, on quality, uh, distinguished service, medical education and clinical excellence. Amit's special interest is pedagogy will be leading the discussion once Ilango finishes his talk. And I, like I said before, we have several special invitees, uh, Dr. J. Damodaran, Dean and Professor of Medicine, Savita Medical College, and Dr. V. Subramaniam, Professor of Anatomy and a leader in digital education, and uh, Professor P. R. Ballal, and we hope to have many more luminaries to join in as we go. Over to you, Ilango. Thank you, Vidya, ma'am. Is my camera open, sir? Are you okay? Thank you, Vidya, ma'am, and uh, Patasar for one more opportunity to present my ideas. Um, for, uh, um, for the talk today is about uh, rethinking undergraduate medical education. So when we start, uh, when we started working on the LGS platform, we were primarily aiming at the surgical students. Uh, but as uh, we worked on with more and more of these students, we realized uh, something in their foundation is not right. Uh, so uh, I sort of ventured into their territory and uh, tried to look at things from their point of view and try to help them become better doctors. Some of the work which we did in the uh, last one and a half years uh, is uh, forms the scope of this talk. So <clears throat> the talk, the topic that was given was rethinking undergraduate medical education. Um, apart from being a transplant surgeon, I sort of fiddle around with uh, most of these failed causes and uh, a sort of dream. Uh, what I wanted to talk today was that whether 
uh, we can reimagine undergraduate medical education. And I will say that um, my imagination need not always be right, and I'm open to debate. <clears throat> uh, uh, my disclaimer is that uh, that I have never taught uh, as an, uh, an MBBS student, or I have never worked in an academic hospital as a faculty. So um, I have no direct experience as a, a teacher in a lecture hall. I also have a small company and I serve as a director. It's called Crossroads Learning Solutions. It works on uh, my small experiments for my own fun and uh, benefit. It has benefited a few people. I'm sorry, the slide keeps moving. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, and we have some products, one of which is Cubase. So uh, these are some things I believe. The sense of education is not to transfer knowledge. It is to guide the learning process, to put the responsibility for study into the student's own hands and to place people on their own path to discovery and invention. Um, I learned differently in a completely different era 30 years ago. Uh, books were the main source of knowledge, and I spent a lot of time in uh, the libraries trying to get the best algorithms which I can use in my bedside clinical medicine. And um, today I reflect on that, and I, and I feel that whether I can teach another student to learn well and learn differently in a different era at this point in time. There are quite a few general questions which needs to be answered whenever we um, prepare someone to serve as a doctor in a massive population. Um, how can health be delivered to such a massive population is a political question. It is an economist's question, but it is of importance to every one of us um, living in a particular country. So the, from the point of view of a teacher, we have to answer these three questions. Who is a doctor? What are the skills that make a doctor? And how skilled, what's the depth of skills a basic doctor must possess in order to effectively deliver healthcare? To look at this, I looked at all the MBBS subject content with which our uh, uh, junior doctors and medical students wrestle with. There are roughly 19 subjects on it. And you'll be surprised if you look at the subject content, it is impressively stable even across continents. Um, uh, the books, uh, the, uh, the teaching methodology, the subject content is quite stable. There are two aspects of which, which, which are actually variable between the different countries and continents, which are the boundaries are uh, the borders of the knowledge, which is, uh, which is a skill depending on the responsibility of the physician and the depth and the depth of the knowledge, which is based on the clinical situation. Um, so to effectively transfer knowledge, we should look at this training, like how we are going to train a child to ride a bicycle. We may uh, initially introduce them to the world of bicycles. We may walk with them while they train and allow them to handle things independently. But the most important, and they sometimes they learn very well. The children learn very effectively. But the most important thing you must remember is that while we teach them how to ride a bicycle, we must also remember that they may not be riding bicycles all their life. For a job, they may do something as complex as uh, flying a B1, B21 stealth bomber for their day job. So it might be as complex as them. So all that a teacher can do is that we can boast that we have taught them how to ride a bicycle, which is no longer useful for them in their life. So <clears throat> knowledge transfer alone does not work. We have to learn how to learn independently in a changing environment and more complex environment. Basically, a doctor's training program has got four levels. It is MBBS, a broad specialty, a super specialty, a fellowship. Sometimes you have post-fellowship training also. The idea of a medical training is to produce skilled and empathetic human beings who are capable of caring for other suffering human beings. The key to a, being a good doctor is professional independence. Instead of this, in India, we have doctors who live by an examination to examination existence. This has led to the proliferation of numerous products in the market, which actually aims to game the system. A lot of these students have fallen prey for these things, and they utilize most of these um, you know, platforms 
in order to gain the skill but what i have gone through them and and feel that they teach the same subjects in a different paper format and using different software so it's essentially gaming the system an mbbs doctor ends up studying 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 throughout their life but the key question what we should do is that we should know what the doctor needs to know to say that he actually knows the subject my slides keep moving is it okay for all of you uh, you are on wiki on technical learning okay okay all right ma'am so this is something which i always uh, so uh, ilango just a quick thing you might have put your slides on a timer which is probably why they're automatically moving so oh, just make okay. sure that it's not okay okay i was experimenting with the timing but anyway i'll keep keep managing that thank you so the, the the wiki on technical training this is what i do wiki stands for wisdom intelligence knowledge and information you have to work it from uh, on the rubers okay information is about what is data measurable facts uh, pictures that information should be sequenced and organized to form knowledge and when you apply the knowledge to new situations we call that intelligence and if you know the limitations of your intelligence or able to apply intelligence in cross situational application it is called wisdom mbbs essentially works on information and knowledge level throughout the five and a half years of training so a student who does very well if they are able to do both these things very well the information collection and the ability to sequence or organize them they become good mbbs doctors if you look at several blogs i have summarized a few of them skilling skilling in young doctors requires certain skills uh, certain uh, components these components are listed on the left side communication emotional intelligence teamwork leadership skills resilience capacity for lifelong learning but none of this are actually testable they are generic skills when you apply the testability filter only two of them turn out what we can actually assess in a student one is problem solving skills and decision making skills to assess them we identify six elements their ability to define the problem to determine the risks the solutions to develop a comprehensive viewpoint of the problem select the right solution implement the solution and evaluate the outcome from application of that solution so these things we we developed the best thing what what happened was that uh, during the covid years a lot of these students were really confused the mbba students were probably ignored there were problems in their transiting between the mbbas to the pg days um during one such time a lot of doctors in our hospital um resigned together so i met them in the corridor and asked them why they wanted to resign a job because the world was going through a pandemic and probably being a doctor is is probably the best profession they could have been in order to help the others in in that situation but they all said that they wanted to use that opportunity to listen to the lectures so that they can prepare for a better postgraduate course i was um, i was stunned because the experience that covid could provide them cannot be matched by any other training program um that sort of uh took me through this journey so we looked at the traditional medical teaching methods we all know that the average attention span of an adult is about 20 minutes but lectures remain for remain the most important method of medical education in mbbs but the retention rate in a lecture is just 5% the other method of learning is clinical demonstration which has about a 30 percentage retention rate but the actual uh, good ones apart from teaching is practicing on its own this has about a 75 percentage retention rate we do not have a decision making training platform in the world till now i think as we are talking up to date pathways is just coming up um they are still developing it it's growing slowly to help people make better decisions but apart from that there is no training 
this software. So surprisingly, when I looked at all the other uh, neat PG solutions that these PGs were listening, most of these lectures, if you look at them, they had about an hour and 57 minutes, an hour and 55 minutes. And I pulled up some of the uh, uh, timings, except for one video, which is about nine minutes, rest of them were all quite long. And the students will get about or three or four tidbits of information from the lecture while wasting about a couple of hours to listen through each one of them. So this sort of game became uh, a little serious when, um, when we started using computer programs. I was learning Python at that time. So we wrote down a program to do Rotem and Teg training for uh, people who work in transformation. The computer would churn up a few numbers, and based on the, those numbers, when you put the input and make a decision, it will tell you whether it's right or wrong. So we were in, we were using computer-generated numbers to train human beings, which was a sort of experiment we were doing at that time. So we wondered whether we could apply this to a, a greater number of people in order to help them with their medical training. So every, as I talked to you before, Professional independence is the goal of every MBBS training. At the end of that, they must have reasonable professional independence to stand on their own feet. So it's, it's similar to USMLE step three. Uh, to do this, they have to gather information. They have to sequence the information. They have to make the right decision uh, based on the gathered information. And they should have the skills and the ability to deploy the skills in appropriate clinical situations. So I have given the sub groups under them. Information gathering requires they must be able to identify, they must be able to derive information from variables, and they must be able to interpret them. Sequencing the information, um, the, uh, it's just a generic one. The raw information sequencing is just one information after the other. The interpretation and sequencing is that you have to derive a a secondary number, and then from there you have to uh, interpret the sequence. For decision making, you have to identify start points, the next points, and the end points. And obviously, skill deployment requires life saving skills, common ailment treatment, and health system training. Today, in medical education, there is no uh, the gap between the actual clinical the actual situation on the ground, and the ideal goal is not clearly defined because the the knowledge goal and the skill goal of an MBBS doctor is not defined in most uh, uh, academic environments. So here, but we have identified some problems in the gap and we have some solutions for them like train the trainer, which is commonly occurs in specialties. Uh, the syllabus has been made robust and now we are having a uniformity in assessment and certification in the form of NEXT and um, supplemental training programs. Uh, I am not actually a, a faculty in a medical college, so I wanted to focus on something which I could make a difference in. So we focused on supplemental training programs. In, in uh, Marvelous Medicine, uh, which actually introduced me to the world of software and, uh, and uh, rekindled my interest in pedagogy, we discussed this quite often about using artificial intelligence in medicine. We, have, we don't have the financial muscle to do that, but this is what we did to, to actually make this happen. The supplemental training programs were aimed to do good training in medical decision-making. It is not a skilling method. So what it actually required was creation of a virtual training platform. So we, we needed to create a software program with its own administrative basis the uh, handheld device because the students would uh, wanted to, I wanted the students to carry all the information and the training program on uh, uh, immediately available on demand because whenever they want to go for a coffee break, they can actually add up their skills. And uh, the, the third component is to write great algorithms for diagnosis, evaluation and treatment methods, much similar to what UpToDate is currently trying to do. So the initial uh, training programs were basically used for my own, um, uh, when I was training in Python software, 
And then we transform something to encourage the doctors into a 2020 format, like the T20. It's 20 questions in 20 minutes in a paper format. And then we converted them into Python software. This is how it actually looks like um, in real practice. Uh, it's a small program which churns out 20 questions for them. And the student, when they put an input, it, it gives them an output. It is just an interesting one. It was a part of the exercise that I was do doing in uh, Code Academy. So uh, it interested them a bit. And uh, while they were preparing for uh, PG entrance examination, while this is not a trainer program, it's, it was the basis on which we built the other things. It was only to test the accumulated knowledge. It originally was meant to answer questions, and this is one of the later ones, originally meant to answer smaller clinical questions like hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, um, painkillers, and, and small basic clinical problems. But then to interest them, I put some neat PG questions also. So the, the first steps were where we recognize the role of software in medical training was the huge amount of images that are available in the web. I mean, anybody can Google it, but one should understand what they're going to do out of it. So identifying the diagnosis. So earlier I used to recommend a book called the French Index of Differential Diagnosis, which the senior surgeons and physicians would be aware, but the rest of them, the younger students have never even heard of that book. So we wanted to create some mix of that. So to identify the diagnosis, they have to learn to see clinical parameters like the blue dot sign and stuff like that. The lab numbers that they have to specifically remember. The objects that are used in clinical care like the Thompson's retractors or, or, a, or a low mid cavity forceps. Or imaging basics like the barium is uh, swallow, uh, barium uh, meal image that is given on the uh, picture here or pathology image. So things like this are neat PG questions. These are very difficult for a non-trained person. These are the kind of questions that are being asked by the teachers to the MBBS students. Mind you, this is, this is just basic MBBS questions. I'm sure we all will struggle if we are not told what this is. Obviously, for me, I have done this work for some time, so I have, I'm kind of used to this. This is a perimenopausal woman with uh, vaginal bleeding with a uniform endometrial thickness. Obviously, our clinical suspicion is endometrial carcinoma, but the arrow specifically points out to a hobnail cell. So this only a pathologist will know. Surprisingly, this is asked in neat examination. Uh, this marks a clear cell type and uh, which requires adjuvant treatment. So the layering goes on and on deeply. The, the next one is a three-week male infant with non-bilious projectile vomiting with a lump in the epigastrium. We all know that's a congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, and that's being asked through a radiological question, that to a slightly older one. So today, for the lack of time, I just want to discuss just four methods which we have used to create uh, a teaching environment. The four ones are inversion, layering, waypoint identification, decision-making by repetition. So uh, as, we, uh, as we go on through each one of them, I will discuss this. Inversion starts with inverting the teaching point on its head. There are some huge medical tables that one simply cannot master. So you have to, uh, whenever we started writing software to actually identify staging or a disease algorithm, we had to turn the teaching point on its head. We started with the worst situation, which must not be missed, and then work towards the least dangerous situations. The best question is, what is the worst question uh, thing that should not be missed? So we started writing programs for cancer staging and how to make a doctor learn this very quickly. So the inversion essentially creates an algorithm but the repetition requires a software environment. So here is a breast cancer T-staging. There are six individual components in T-staging for breast cancers. You can see up to seven numbers in them if you count them. In all, the student has to remember about 14 data points for breast cancers T-staging. When you write an algorithm in Python for making the staging, inversion is very useful. So here is the uh, Python algorithm for this. So we start inversely. The T4 staging comes first, where, which has three components. There is no need to worry about size. 
And then if it is a non-T4 disease, then you work down below T3, T2, and T1. So we, the number of data points, when you look at the whole number is intimidating. This is just one T staging. I'm sure the student has to learn quite a bit. They have to learn for stomach, colon, uh, urinary bladder, uterus, uh, ovary, whatnot, lung cancers, and it just keeps going on. It's, and it, the number of data points can become intimidating. So we broke down those numbers so that we can write a proper software and we sequenced them so that they can remember a few critical facts for decision-making. The algorithm writing was quite easy. This is the flowchart method for identifying the lymph node status in breast cancer. So it starts with the supraclavicular node, bilateral is M1, unilateral is N3C and goes down to N N1. Now, how to deploy it requires a different kind of software environment. So we had to rework that. So we reworked and we created clinical scenarios and framed the uh, algorithm through clinical questions. So here's the, the, the complexity of the question can be variable. It can be as blunt as breast primary six centimeters, fixed ipsilateral axillary lymph node will give the same training impact as a complex question which describes a lot of things. So this is in between. A 32-year-old breast cancer seen in the clinic puts the scenario in position. Breast primary is six centimeters in size. Ipsilateral fixed axillary lymph node. TNM staging is the training module required. So this is a non-T4 disease. It is six centimeters. So it is T3. That is more than five centimeters. And then the ipsilateral axillary lymph node, we go to T3 and 2. And we provide a simple explanations. There is no nonsensical thing. That's another thing we had to develop. We had to uh, remove all the unnecessary information so that the student gets to rework on the algorithm so that they can apply it directly in clinical practice. So asking the right question, giving them immediate feedback, providing a simple uh, uh, explanation to reinforce principles was very, very important. Now, this is another example, an eight centimeter with adherent to the skin, fixed axillary, and supraclavicular node, T3 and 3C. Again, the explanation is given. Now, if you look at that, the scenario keeps changing, but what we have given here is no numbers, just pure orange. And they have to identify the T stage. The key thing is reinforcement. Thus, we wanted to make sure even the small things like edema, a pure orange, should not be missed. In a massive lecture where you lecture, 100 students per class, majority of them can miss this minor finding. But when you make them practice on a software, almost 100% of them will get it. And the retaining capacity is about 75%, like I told you. But with repetition, they can use the skills well into their old life or old age. The second problem, what I want to show us about tubal ectopic pregnancy, it's about decision making. There's a huge number of information, a huge amount of information. Uh, they are asking something from the ACOG practice or the green top guidelines from the NHS for uh, ectopic pregnancy. And this uh, algorithm is actually from NEJM. But to present this, we had to simplify them. So we gave them clinical problems for them to solve, but we know that the treatment of ectopic pregnancy requires laparotomy, laparoscopy, uh, medical treatment or conservative treatment. To do that, we rewrote the algorithm. Uh, the algorithm is given on the right extreme point, and we ran these again and again. Um, this is only one such example. We made sure that their decision making is right. So here in this question, you don't see the hemodynamic parameters. Initially, we presented as hemodynamically unstable so that they can select laparotomy. Then we started writing the blood pressure, actual blood pressure numbers, in which this is a two-layered one, which they can make a decision. So thoughtful repetition was required for encoding long-term memory. So that was the second part of the software work which we did. So the whole idea was to create a safe environment where the students can make mistakes. But at the bedside, clinical decisions must be made spontaneous and as error-free as possible, okay? And the second one is layering. So uh, the example that I have chosen for layering is a chest trauma. A chest trauma uh, has got two major components of the deadly dozen, the lethal six, which is identified on primary survey, and the, the hidden six, 
which is identified on a, a secondary survey. The secondary survey requires investigations. So for the layering experiment, I have not dealt with the primary survey because you have to be very direct. Uh, airway obstruction is, is on the primary survey. It's part of every workup. The student has to know. There are, uh, we train them to. Uh, the surprise was that when we actually uh, rounded the MIOT ICU and uh, we talked to one of the, and I asked them, this liver surgery patient is stable. So what was the primary survey? And there was blank stairs. So that is how we started working on this uh, lethal sex. So here for the secondary survey, we have a blunt chest trauma, a BP is reduced, air entry is left on the left side is reduced, dull percussion, obviously left hemothorax. The supine chest X, I have not given the picture here, shows a widened mediastinum. We can ask questions on what a widened mediastinum, which is eight centimeters on supine and six centimeters on the vertica. Those are the two numbers they have to identify. So each time they measure on a scale, this hits them. If it is 6.5 centimeters, it will show them. So the widened mediastinum measurement was 6.8, 6.9 centimeters. Still, they get the memory that the six centimeters on a erect film and uh, eight centimeters on a supine film are the most important numbers to remember. So it asks about the diagnosis, the investigation of choice, uh, the next uh, treatment maneuver. I mean, in ATLS, they are very particular. Once you identify aortic rupture, they have to transfer the patient to a, a higher level trauma center. The last one is just an anatomical quiz. It's just to increase the number of layers. The student has to go through all these kind of questions to arrive at that one particular uh, uh, part of that question. So this is another way of decision making. Uh, this is from parasitology. This is Plasmodium falciparum. Uh, the crescent-shaped gametocyte is shown here. That's an identifier. So clearly, this is to make a diagnosis on a peripheral smear. Imagine for seeing a falciparum, we had to go to the microbiology lab um, and ask the technician to help us with that. Now it's much more possible to do it in the software. That was what was exciting for me. And the same thing, we have the variance for identifying things in for uh, uh, false paramalidia. But the third one is a clinical question. As patient is seen uh, from Megalia, is seen in clinic with malaria, with false paramalidia, and it asks about the recommended treatment. It should be ACT. And we add one more layer. Now the per the first smear is given, they have to identify falciparum and then give the recommendation based on all the parameters that are given. So this layering sequences knowledge. What is good is that the application can cross go across subjects. Here we came from parasitology, variants, application in medicine, and then in SPM. In, uh, so it was very good. But dear ma'am, please stop me if I'm exceeding time. So the- Yes, you just go ahead. The, the third point was, was a, a, an information like this, the ATLS classification of hemorrhagic shock. So <clears throat> a lot of uh, youngsters actually uh, look at this. This is huge amount of information for them. Uh, so it's a four by uh, seven table that they have to remember and how to digest this information. So what we did is we looked at information like this provided on tables and in order to encourage them, we broke down the components into waypoints so that they can identify the right waypoint where the pathophysiology of the patient changes. So here in hemorrhagic shock, they have to identify class four shock and give the adequate resuscitation or a class three shock. So uh, for this number, we looked at everything and said, you don't have to remember. It's a very commonly asked question for their exams as well. So to identify a class 4 shock, all that you have to know is the heart rate more than 140. If you identify that, it's a class 4 shock. Uh, a heart rate more than 120 is a class 3 shock for sure. Uh, so we, we taught them like that. And we taught them that the percentage of blood loss was just the tennis game numbers, 40, 30, and 15. So to bring down information like this into smaller waypoints, allowed those students to digest. Now, here is one more uh, thing which we have worked at. This is on early pregnancy. See, uh, when I was a student, I hated obstetrics and gynecology from the way it was taught. All what we were asked to stand at the bedside and read a book called Shaw, where it will read about uh, chocolate or endometriosis. Or we, I, I had no idea as, as, a, as a person 
with dyslexia, with a bit of dyslexia, I rapidly lose interest in these things. So uh, I worked on obstetrics because that was my toughest subject, and this has now become one of my favorite topics. And um, I still buy books when I must OG just to solve questions for my fun. So early pregnancy vaginal bleeding has got three differential diagnoses, GTD, uh, miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. And you can see how much components you can add into the decision-making tree. The viability, special site of information, the, uh, the discriminatory level of beta HCG, the basic algorithm, the associations in GTD, it, it's endless. Rather than reading a book, if you are able to create algorithms like this, you can actually make them learn better. So almost everything which I have given here, and these are questions, these have abdominal discomfort and vaginal bleeding. And each one of them will help you diagnose and learn more about abortions, the decision-making and uh, uh, the diagnosis of the abortion, the type, and the treatment modality, and for ectopic as well. So the last one is decision-making by repetition. So on the left side, it's a commonly asked question, which I have got from one of their websites. Um, it's, a, it's a clinical problem with a radiograph. A person with abdominal pain fever, an X-ray is shown, and they have asked what will be the most likely diagnosis. Now, if you say the X-ray does not specify what it is, obviously they have to identify this is a chest X-ray, PA view, which shows cast with the diaphragm, meaning it's hollow viscous perforation. So for a trainer, I don't look at this question. So I'm not trying to solve the question. The question can be variable. What I'm going to teach them is acute abdominal pain evaluation, radiological evaluation, acute abdominal pain. So I have improved the same question and I have given a detailed one. This I can play with. The same X-ray or a different chest X-ray with a pneumoperitoneum can be used to teach endless number of scenarios till they are able to identify gas under the diaphragm from without fail, which is a very key skill for that student. So uh, for abdominal pain and evaluation, we started running smaller things like this. Uh, uh, my, my reference book was an old book called uh, by Dido Ball. Uh, his book on surgical decision making also was a very great helpful help for me. And uh, I think uh, we picked up from that. And as we run, we play the algorithm. So to identify acute appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, and hollow viscous perforation, we run the scenarios so that they can identify. And for each, we have we run the diagnostic tests, the treatment modalities, and stuff like that. This again, for interpretation of plain X-ray abdomen, they must be able to identify free air, small bowel obstruction, or large bowel obstruction. See, I have taken the question from neat PG examinations. But I wanted to want them to train differently. So I have given them values and clinical material that are available at the bedside, which will be useful to make them as better doctors. And at the same time, you know, to, to make the medicine go down, we have sugar coated so that they can use it for their exams as well. So we, we are forced still now, we are forced to use things with some examination references but we have done enough work to include most of the algorithms that are required in clinical practice for them to learn. So uh, the key problem with this is gaming again and a phenomenon called fading. So a person selects to do a particular thing and does an immediate repetition. It looks like they have mastered the subject, but to encode something in long-term memory, we must allow the subject to go off from the focus mode to the diffuse mode and allow for something called fading, forgetting of some of the information. That is the 25% that retention loss. So we had to do repetition at specified intervals and repetition with different time frames and different kind of questions, aiming to answer the same algorithm. So we had to do a trainer mode in which there is no timing. They can take time. Uh, they can take the time to make decisions. The testing mode in which they are focused on one particular subject and then we timed them. Most of these ideas I have not got. They are, they are not original. Uh, my favorite book in my uh, undergraduate surgery years was a book called Primary Surgery by, by Morris King and Peter Buess. I had two of these. I carried them with me for 14 years. Then I gave them to another. 
most of you will know uh, Professor Samina Nandi as a, as a GI surgeon, but in 1994, when I bought those books, I had no idea of GI surgery. And all I know about Professor Samina Nandi was that he was one of the key authors for the book I loved most. So this was cut along the dotted line. So it was very easy for a student to master airways, to master uh, primary survey, and I, it encouraged me to take up surgery. Obviously, as I grew bigger, I started using more uh, standard references like uh, uh, Moore, Mattox, and Feliciano's trauma manual. But these are information. What I wanted to tell you is that the key difference and mastery came from the ability to learn through the ATLS student course manual. This was the game changer. This was the key that opened all the doors in trauma for me. Once I learned this course material, everything in the trauma manual and in primary surgery started making sense. Obviously, with experience, you grow beyond that, but still the ATLS is the key. Something, we, uh, what we wanted to work on was on surgical aspects where we have to prepare keys similar to the advanced trauma life support so that the students can learn better. We are working at present, we are learning by gaming. We are providing, cre creating something called the labor assistant. Um, the, if you look at the ACOG guidelines or the green top guidelines from the NHS, they're phenomenal documents. Um, they are very interesting to read, but on the ground, 95% of the labors are going to be normal. Remember that students who train from Ukraine or from the CIS countries, they have not even done a single normal delivery. So right now we are working on something to create labor, uh, sorry, the labor ward scenarios to guide them through normal labor and then gradually work on the abnormal labor. So this is learning the gaming. And we also recognized the algorithm gap filling is another way of learning. So we looked at the small uh, handheld devices, uh, the phone uh, game softwares, and looked at these are good ones. The third one is sequence ordering, ordering the right sequence so that the treatment will go on properly and they can identify and uh, make better decisions in the bedside. We're also, we also did a lot of work on calculators for bedside work. One of our work was identifying whether the suitability of liver grafts or uh, living donor liver transplantation for the senior specialist surgeons. So uh, these are some things which we are working. Uh, so the gaps which we have identified are that the technology utilization in medical colleges is actually a game changer. Um, when I was in training, these were not available. We, we had the internet, but we didn't have video-based learning uh, for looking at technical issues or the ability to train on a high-speed internet. So handheld technology is a game changer. Uh, what, what I feel is that none of this training is, should be after MBBS. These students, when they finish MBBS, they are spending most of their time listening to lectures on a platform. Which, uh, which has a disconnect actually. So we feel that uh, the software environment has to be integrated inside medical colleges and they have to train during their MBBS. Uh, uh, Balasubramaniam sir, uh, when he gave the first lecture on learn, let's learn surgery, he gave a good suggestion. I was uh, working on software environments. I was trying to learn software and trying to create this and that. He said, your expertise is not, does not lie in writing the software. It's going to take a long time. You can hire people to do that. But what is required is to write the right algorithms. So if you write good algorithms and it serves a lot of uh, students, they, may be, they will become better doctors in the future. On the student side, there were some things which I learned when I was working in Cubase. They, the students are completely confused about what data they should remember and the information weightage. You, you sometimes, you know, they are burdened by numerous mnemonics that they don't know which mnemonic to apply in which situation. The most difficult thing in working with these students is that they want a quick fix for entrance examinations. Their idea is to qualify for NEET or to qualify the super specialty examinations, and they are looking for a quick fix while we are looking to make them better doctors, even in the position where they are. So there is a complete absence of wholesome development among the students and they are completely, I mean, there is a doctor who works for the night and thus attends all the lectures during the daytime. He reaches the hospital at night, pretty much no social life, no wholesome development. 
it's unfortunate that gaming the examination system has become extremely acceptable and this has come to dominate training that even first year mbbs students start preparing for the neat examination um, regarding the entrance examinations we also i also feel that there is no plan or purpose uh, for the entrance examinations they 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 just is an it's an exclusion program how can we ask a question which the student will not know I wish one student will know. They don't know how to weightage. I provide weightage to the questions and then uh, see how it will be useful for them in their uh, uh, in their careers. Uh, working on software. We definitely know that software enhances medical training. But the right method is unknown at this point. So we have tried the Socratic method, the algorithm training, learning by gaming. Um, uh, New England Journal of Medicine had a COVID training software at the peak of COVID. They have taken it down recently. I actually wanted that also was an inspiration. It was creating a virtual clinical environment where you can treat COVID patients. So that was very good. We need to work on those methods also. But what I learned is that there is no right method that is identified at this point. So we are still open for experimentation. These are the things that I learned. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ilango, for packing in so much of material in the specified time. Over to you, Amit Ghosh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ilango, for, as, as I said, it was going to be a roadshow of a different kind. Um, you have just opened up an entire bag of, uh, I would say, opportunities, I wouldn't say worms. We, we still don't know what's the best way of learning, what's the best way of teaching, uh, but what has come to the point is that all the things that we teach now is based on the philosophy of the country. In India, most of our medical education came from empirism, which is the empiric way of looking at it from the British, which is based on careful observation of the world. In US, it is more of the same thing based on careful observation of the world and also rationalism, which is a way of applying logic. Now, the biggest problem which has happened is uh, because of the logic uh, application, everything has to be precisely measured, precisely uh, our conclusions have to be drawn out, and there has to be a sound step of uh, reasoning. So this leads to a lot of debate, as, as you said, many different ways of looking at it, and a lot of these debates end up with some adversarial comments. The biggest uh, challenge is all the dichometers way, this uh, dual way of looking, uh, algorithmic approach, which is very good for a micro environment, especially in a ICU setting or a trauma setting, does not really work in the real world situation uh, because it's either or kind of a thing. So what I find in the reductionist approach, which is really testable uh, in test or like you said, Python and other things, uh, creates creates a problem when you see a patient in the real world. Uh, and that's why there are very few people who know how to deal of deal ambiguous situation or uncertain situations. I found, because I've trained both in India and US, I found a great degree of certainty in India where uh, because of the uncertainty of our daily life and uncertainty being um, in the Indian philosophy, uh, the whole concept of how to manage it, we were very well uh, Think about the being cautious, careful, uh, supportive, empathy way of approaching uncertainty. In US, it's it's a great discomfort. There's a very pragmatic approach here in the Western uh, philosophy which we use here. We would rather say take something which deals an outcome. It may still be an untruth. It may be a partial truth, but that's how what is followed up. And we saw that in COVID with all these different medications which became uh, blown out of proportion as being um, that this is the only way to go and then later they were they were taken off and the debate continues so a student is often very challenged uh, i would say we all game the system to get into pg there's no way of getting into pg without understanding how to read in fact one of the thing which I, when i went uh, to one of my pg students a brilliant uh, student in jipmar asking him how do i become a good doctor he said you know he learned this story from a from a law student who went to a famous lawyer and said, sir, teach me law, teach me law. Um, you're so famous, teach me law. And the lawyer said, do you have that degree which says that you have passed the bar? 
He says, no, no, I have, to, I have to, you have to give the exam. He says, yeah, first go and get that bar degree, and then I'll teach you how to, how to become a, a, a famous lawyer, a big lawyer. Medicine is continuously evolving, and the curriculum which you are proposing is very important. We don't know how to teach, uh, what should be there in the curriculum, how to test. A lot of this uh, table, uh, the staging format, which is testable in India, uh, surprisingly are not tested here in the US uh, because they're easily, you can download these things and you can get a stage much more accurate than just relying on the memory. In fact, students from India who come here have already studied Harrison's. They have studied all the books. Uh, it's phenomenal amount of uh, theoretical knowledge before they're faced with the patient here. And then it becomes complex as to how all the other things which you talked about, emotional intelligence, how to how to make a decision under uncertainty, how to uh, deal with a complex problem where uh, the, the mediational map thing is not six, it may be 5.8 or, or less, is it a dissection or not? So all of these things have led to multiple layering of information which has come up. But having said that, how do you train people? How do you train students? How do you even make them certifiable into doctors? Uh, that's the question for today. I have a plethora of magnificent uh, educators here, world-class leaders uh, from Dr. Nandi and Dr. Rajaram. All of them are there. Uh, I, would, I would pass the baton to Dr. Mohan Raman uh, to kind of lead the discussion as to how should we learn? Um, what should be the best way of identifying becoming a good doctor? Should we wait to get the degree, to get the medical school graduate, get into PG? or should we do something else? Having said that, the best medical students who get into all these fancy medical schools like Ames and all that are one of the best gamers of the system. They can understand, they can synthesize, and they can take the test to great extent. It doesn't protest to how, what, what will happen 10 years down the line, what kind of doctor they'll become. But at that moment, they are masters of the game. So is it a good way? Is it a bad way? Who's got to decide? We don't know. In US, we have gone into the pass-fail stage. Uh, we have taken away from the US MLE first. It's either you pass or you fail. The system of creating grades and creating numbers are causing increasingly stress to people. Um, and we are not finding truly that, that in the long run, somebody who's got a higher grade has become a better doctor. So there's lots, lots and lots. It's a, a lots of questions to think about. Um, over to you, Vidya. Uh, thank you, Ghosh. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Nandi, for logging in. Uh, uh, we'd like to hear from you, sir. Please unmute yourself. Uh, could you please unmute yourself, sir, Professor Nandi? Uh, Professor Nandi, your mic is off. Can you hear? Yes, sir. See, I was an undergraduate in Cambridge University. And I was there at the age of 17 and a half. And what struck me, I'm very impressed by Dr. Ilango's lecture. It's full, it's very high class lecture. But it missed the point that I was going to raise. The point that I was going to raise was that when I was an undergraduate, I was treated like an adult. The porters, they called me sir. The teachers to, uh, were equal to me. They weren't, we didn't have to call them sir. And I think the great difference between coming back to India, where to the All India Institute in Delhi, was when people stood up. When I walked into a room, I wasn't used to that because I was used to Cambridge and Mass General and all that, where people are lounging around. I think the most important thing is that in Western countries or places like Cambridge and Harvard, they don't they encourage the students to think. And what we do is tend to give students information. We stuff information down their throats and ask them to regurgitate it. And I think that this is the major difference. And if we respected them 
uh, treated them as equals and asked them how st stimulated them to think we would be their friends as well as produce good doctors. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we have Dr. Subhashish Mishra, who is comparing seeing methods in US and India. Thank you for joining, Dr. Mishra. Your thoughts, please. Uh, Dr. Mohanram and team, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I cannot agree more with uh, Dr. Nandi, uh, as well as uh, thanks to Dr. Dhar for introducing me. Uh, for the group here, I'm a Fulbright scholar, uh, currently at Ames Rishikesh, of which, of course, Dr. Nandi is the president. And, uh, you know, having been both trained uh, here uh, in India and uh, uh, most of my surgical training has been in the United States. Uh, I'm a surgical oncologist, as well as uh, I'm a member of the Academy of Master Surgeon Educators, which is a field that is dedicated for education and training the next generation of surgeons. Um, uh, Dr. Ilango's lecture was great. Uh, and I think there's a lot of point. Um, we are focusing a little bit different. We are focusing on how do we train the trainers. And as Dr. Nandi said, you know, following principles of adult learning, how do we create that curiosity uh, that stimulates the learning in the mind of the learners? Rather than just a lecture is a transfer of information. Our job as teachers should be to you know, provide them with enough uh, uh, knowledge and, and uh, practical applications and let them think independently. That's how they will, the curiosity drives learning. That is the basic principle. So what I'm doing currently here in Rishikesh, for example, is we use certain methods. One of them is just in time teaching. So if I'm talking about breast cancer, I give them, I give the uh, class uh, a series of questions a week before to test a baseline knowledge then I focus on where the class is deficient and, and then we have a discussion about it. So the feedback that I got from the residents here is that that has proven to be very engaging for them. They are much more interested. They want to learn more. Uh, I think we all, there's no one way of doing things. Uh, you know, th this is just the learning part in surgery. There's also another part that is very difficult is the practical aspects. Are we really training safe and competent surgeons who can then go out into the world and practice safe surgery. Um, so these are burning questions and that's what we, I think we all have to uh, sort of look at. Uh, great discussions and uh, we have a lot of work to do as, as educators uh, in this field. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, we have uh, Professor Jay Damodaran, the Dean of Savita Medical College, who's right in the hotbed of uh, what we have been talking about. Uh, we'd like to hear from you, sir. What are the uh, innovations you have been doing at your university? And first of all, good evening to one and all. And I think I feel very humble to be in front of this very august group of people who have achieved so much in medicine and in the field of education. I think the first, when Dr. Ilongo Setu's presentation was fantastic, especially his inversion method. I think made a lot of sense because you know, there's a different kind of learning and teaching which we have experimented. One major problem we face is the governments, you know, the rush to increase the number of doctors in the country and open up the number of seats. For example, we take 250 MBBS students a year. So imagine standing in front of a group of 250 students and taking a class, whatever method you follow, you know, it is going to be, when we started this 250, when I first saw this 250 in a class, then it feels, you know, you're in front of a mob. That is the feeling you get. So, but what we have done now is in this institution, what we did was we divided the 250 students into six small batches. You know, there was a lot of opposition from from, from our own faculty because they feel that we are increasing the teaching hours and things like that. But we still went ahead. We divided the students into six batches. You won't believe parents came and opposed it saying that, why are you doing this? Why can't all the students be in the same class? Why should you divide them into small groups and things like that? But we still, we did go ahead and it's almost a year now. We divide each batch of students into six batches per theory theory. And 
each class is given two hours to discuss a particular topic where we give an introduction and various other things. So this is a major problem in medical education today in the country because in our mad rush to increase the number of doctors, we have sort of brought a situation where the faculty are not comfortable to do any kind of pedagogy. It is very difficult to devise a method to engage these 250 students if you do not think out of the box. And there I think Dr. Elengo Setu's presentation will have a lot of, I have learned a lot from that. And we will try to introduce many of those things, you know, especially the inversion method of teaching, etc. That is number one. Number two, in our mad rush for super specialities, again, we have opened DM and MCH courses for every part of the body. There is an MCH hand surgery. There is an MCH plastic surgery. There is an MC DM gastroenterology. There is a DM hepatology, DM virology. See, I, when you open up so many courses, the end graduate thinks that with MBBS, he can't do anything. Okay, he finishes MBBS and becomes an MD or an MS. And then he thinks, oh, this is not enough. I need to do a super speciality. So he tries for that. So we have come to a stage in the country. I've been in medical education for more than 25 years. Now. This, it is really sad to see our young doctors not able to engage in practice not even start practice. And they are studying for more than 15 years. And then finally he says, after DM or MCH, when I ask him, what do you want to do? Why don't you get into practice? He says, sir, I'd like to do fellowship. Where is the end to this? Our doctors, which we are producing in the country, at least the good ones, are spending time, you know, exam after exam. I fully agree with Elongo for that. They are only in the examination mode from the time, from plus two, they are in an examination mode. And how to change that culture is something that, that we, are, we are at a loss as education is to see this happen. So where are we, how do we change this? How do we change this culture of studying all the time and not engaging in any kind of practice or being useful to society? When is he going to get into practice? We, we come from a background where after MBBS, our seniors told us, please get into practice. Open a clinic, do this, do that. Now today, even after MDMS, after MCHDM, we still, we still feel that they are, he feels that he is not ready to take a practice and get trained. So that is the situation that we are going through. Unless we seriously rethink on all these kind of issues, I, I'm, I'm sure, in India today, there is a mushrooming of softwares and companies which are promoting medical education in a very, very big way. There are MBAs who have gone and come into this field and not only have they taken up corporate hospitals, they have also taken up medical education in a big way. They hire teachers and they create all these fancy softwares. And every other day we see one guy coming and giving a demonstration of you know, this software and that software, and most of them target on an examination system. And ultimately we have come to a situation where students think that passing exam is very important, getting into MD or MS or DMMCH is very important. And he is forgetting the basics of how to manage a patient when he walks into a clinic or when he is faced with an emergency. I mean, this topic can go on and on and on. I don't, I'm not negative at all in this. I still feel that there are people like Ilambo and all the other seniors who are here who still know how to go about this. But I brought up this issue of numbers because there are two problems basically in medical education in the country today. I'm sure nobody in the policy making is going to understand this. One is the mad rush to increase the number of doctors in the country and two, the rush to produce super specialists. Last year, the cutoff was zero for super specialists. Would you believe that? Any guy who applies for DM or MCH would get it. And this year we have filled only two seats, two in neonatology and two in urology. All the other super specialty seats are vacant. There are no takers. And even if you finish a super specialty, I'm sure he's not going to get a job. 
And we have overproduced these super specialists who neither fit into a basic doctor, neither is he becoming a super specialist. And he is, you know, like in, uh, you know, he is caught somewhere in between. And that is the situation. But Dr. Elango, I again have to say your thoughts, I will definitely take a lot of your thoughts. And personally, I've learned so much from you today in medical education. And I think people like you should come and start teaching. The government should open up. The problem with the government is still they are defining who should be a medical teacher. That is another big issue. And most of the best brains are in the private sector, in corporate hospitals. And we are not doing the academic medical centers how they do in the West. So these are some of the issues that are going to be with us for a long time. And I'm sure we will find some answers for all this. Personally, in our institution, we have gone into small group teaching. We divide the batches into many, many six batches. And each batch will have only 40 to 50 students. And a teacher will engage them for two, two hours each on a particular topic. We do assessments every day, like how Dr. Elongo did. Probably not, not so good, but we still do assessment each and every day. And every week we do an assessment and we try to take it forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidya. It has been a very uh, you know, momentous occasion to be in front of all these great people. I again, thanks a lot for all of them, and especially to Dr. Elango, who stuck his neck out and came out with this fantastic presentation. Thank you, sir, and I invite you one day, I will come and personally invite you to come to our institution and talk to us. And one more thing is to train our faculty. That is another major challenge. If you ask a faculty to follow what Dr. Elango is going to, what he has said, he is not going to accept it immediately. He will still go back to his traditional method of lecturing to 250 people where half the fellows will be sleeping and the other half will be, you know, doing something on his laptop or his things like that. So thank you very much, madam. I think I took some time. I'm very sorry if I exceeded my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, we really needed uh, to hear from someone who is in the thick of things because most of us, as you mentioned, are in the not private really. sector, not really hands-on with undergraduate students. We have uh, Professor uh, C.R. Balal who has seen uh, at least three of uh, three generations of uh, students yes. and uh, the question about uh, competence and uh, uh, the questions that uh, Professor Damodaran raised as to what happens once a person finishes uh, being trained as a surgeon and what what is the current situation your thoughts on that sir uh, thank you very much dr vidya uh, i think most of the points which i wanted to mention have already been discussed in detail it looks as if i am going to put the last nail on the coffin because of education is so bad that maybe that uh, my comments will complete the whole picture. The only thing that I have, I have been trying this for the last 20 years totally failed. If engineering colleges and industries could join together and train the engineers, why not the private institutions and the medical colleges join together? I, we wanted a pilot uh, project in uh, Bangalore. Unfortunately, you know, in the capitals, the politicians are more powerful than the doctors. And even the vice chancellor was keen, but, but the powers that be in the government sector were totally against it. Maybe because sometimes mediocrity is prevalent so much, they don't want to show their mediocrity. But uh, Dr. Ilanga has done wonderful work. It looks beautiful uh, as a slice of concern, but as Dr. Damodar has put it across, I think the basic thing is to train the trainers. Teachers, unfortunately, those who come and join, most of them have no zeal for teaching. We were lucky. I'm sure the seniors yes. in the, we are lucky that we had a band of people who are really, I, I use the word addicted teaching. Whether yes. you like it or not, you are called it. And if there's an emergency at midnight also, they'll be called, they'll be shown operation. Hand-on training is practically absent. Uh, I right. inquired with a first-year MS student. That girl had done one hernia in the entire one year. At the end of three years, what about skills? Then, regarding your other attributes, less said about the better. Somebody said uh, they start uh, uh, thinking about the exams from the 12th plus to know. And NEET and uh, JE, the parents start training the student from the eighth standard onwards. 
There's a Fiji and the Baiju, there's so many things now. And from the eighth class onwards, they have no other activity, no physical sports, because they right from school, they come back from school immediately they rush to the coaching center. This goes on until, as Professor Damodar put it, until they reach the age of 30 or 35, because they'll be continuously preparing for one exam after another exam. I think it has to be a total change. I wish Dr. Ilanga the best of luck because I think it's a very, very hard way. Correct. He has done a lot of original work, but put it into practice. Uh, Dr. Damodar would know though because he is in charge of uh, one of the prestigious institutions in the city of Chennai. He would be right in the middle of these things. To put it into practice is not easy. I wish you luck. Honestly, I'm one of those who always believed that there is intentions are noble, but to put in practice, there are a lot of problems. Of course, all the other points have been discussed in detail, and uh, such wise men like Dr. Nandi and they all spoken about it. I thank Dr. Vidya for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you sir. Extremely good and informative evening. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank we have uh, Professor Vikram Karte from uh, Jipmar. Uh, an educationist himself, uh, uh, Dr. Karte, your thoughts? Uh, am I audible? I'm speaking. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I will have a little bit of uh, contrary views for what people have told up till now. Okay. Maybe the views are based on my experience uh, teaching at Jitmer. I'm here for the last uh, more than three decades. So, a uh, few things I would like to tell. First, uh, Lee, uh, I acknowledge what everybody has uh, echoed that uh, Dr. Langua's lecture was fantastic. But uh, I just uh, thought that uh, let me see whether what uh, the different types of methods he has told. If I have to apply that and utilize it, I think uh, I'm in a position where I have one of the best students here. I can say that. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Patta is from here, is undergraduate, Dr. Vidya, everybody is undergraduate of Jipmar and uh, I will vouch for it that we have very good students, good students, uh, maybe not so good on average, but the teaching methods, what I thought earlier, which we used to teach with those uh, extrances and then slides and videos and the interactions and small group interactions, all the people who are from undergraduates from here and all from good institutes can definitely tell that if they get very well trained during the MBBS, actually there is nothing much to be read after the MBBS for the entrance exams even now. I'm telling this example not from Jitmer, right now need results. I always very closely interact with students so that because they ask for guidance. So they told that right now NEET and that immediate results were declared. Two students, one UG PG from Ames and one PG from Chandigarh. Within one month, they got top ranks and they can get any of the DMMCA seats in India. One of them has got GI surgery, literally topped in that. So I asked how long that person has studied. That person has studied only for one month post MS. You see the difference. Only one month post MS, I asked that student, somebody indirectly through somebody, how that person got it. He said he answered all the questions in the examination, what he learned during his MS. So see the difference. As I said, I'm giving a contrary view that we are seeing that we feel that the education has deteriorated, but we still have like this. Within one month, I'm telling this to institutes and not naming Jipna. Jipna, we have several students similar to that. If the student is good, then the student will do well. If the student is not so good, not so good means what I mean is their training and whatever way. Then I agree with the students. They only have told me that these apps have come. Dr. Elangun has shown one of the apps at Maro app. And these students who have got very good solid fundamental knowledge, they use these apps to actually super add on that knowledge and they score very. You can guarantee and say that within one year of their graduation or post-graduation, they'll get in the best schools in India abroad. And I know like uh, we have Dr. Ghosh here who's at Mayo Clinic, he's also undergraduate of Jipman. So I can say that seeing my students, they, many of them who are good will perform fantastically well throughout their life. That is what I say. It's totally contrary view I'm taking to everybody. But this is what I've seen from our students. There are students who are unfortunate and they don't get proper training as everybody has mentioned. Like maybe the teachers are not very keen, not very interested. Then of course, the things go down the line and they might not have that much and they have to rely heavily upon uh, post MBBS uh, training 
once I went for a course, uh, it was MRCS come DNB or some course, something I had to give a lecture. They said, see, I've got a postgraduate student working in one of the corporate hospitals in Chennai. The student is very good, performs everything very well. The, perform, the person reports everything very well, very sincere, but the person has not passed the DNB surgery examination three times. What's the reason for that? I said, unfortunately, in any of the examination in India, they don't look at that. I, I actually persuade my students to do research, but you can only persuade, we cannot force them to do research because nowhere in the curriculum research comes into the examination practice. So you can't say that you have to write four papers to get an admission at Jipmer, Chandigarh or PGI or AIMS because it's only the entrance exam. So if you have the endpoint, such as the entrance, which has to go through, even if we have varied types of things that we say that they should gain knowledge, as long as the principal method, the outcome does not change, the fruit does not change, the method to go to the fruit does not change, nothing will change. That is what I feel. That's my impression. It might be contrary to many things. And I would uh, like to congratulate Dr. Elong as well. Fantastically, he has tried to make things very simple. And I would like to like him to test what he has done it on two groups of students whom he feels that they're very well trained at the MBBS level and whom he feels they're not that much well trained at MBBS level and see how it works. Because uh, I think that in this sort of group, just to add the last point, that we should have lots of students because many times what happens, we talk as teachers, senior teachers, consultants. We should interact. We could have had 10, 15 students here and take the views of them and they'll correctly tell exactly what they want, how they want and how they should proceed. That is how actually, uh, I don't know whether uh, many of the people are aware. Now, when neat results are declared, they have a WhatsApp group of first 500 ranks, first 1000 ranks and first 1500 ranks. And they dissect out each and every department in the country to find out which is best for them. This is how they do. They know actually more than what we think they know. Thank you, Dr. Vidya, for this opportunity. Yeah. And I'm open to any of the questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, Dr. Karte, we did share, I mean, at least I tried to share the link with the students as well. We've had, we've heard enough from senior teachers. So I'd like to call upon Rashmi Yadav who actually wrote a paper on undergraduate medical education, a pursuit from India or abroad. Rashmi, your views on what's been spoken, and we'd like you to be frank and open and call a spade a spade. Over to you, Rashmi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as a uh, UG yeah, graduate... Let me see you, Rashmi. Almost... Yes, sir, sure, sir. Hi. Hello, good evening, everyone. Ma'am, as a UG graduate, what I feel and uh, what I have experienced also, I am also a Marrow subscriber. And uh, what I think uh, in today's world, uh, exams are considered to be the, uh, if I clear the exam for the PG entrance, then I'll be able to get into the PG. Okay. And at the UG level, we are not that much taught or not experienced that much to handle uh, the situations we can face in day-to-day -day life as a medical uh, practitioner. Or I can say, uh, ma'am, what I feel is uh, as a stu um, the students uh, go about learning everything and they do not go into the OPDs or the clinics to experience everything. I feel this is lacking. And uh, also what I think is, as I have done internship uh, very recently, and I have seen many, many clinical situations and many clinical, uh, I'm able to uh, coordinate my information, what I have uh, learned throughout these years and what I can gain actually more from patient perspective. Okay. Well, I think the, all of it is lacking. And what I feel is we can uh, change, we can fix the, uh, I think, ma'am, we have all the, as a MBBS curriculum doesn't contain what information should be taught, what information, what uh, uh, medical practitioner should 
be having when he graduates it is not fixed it is not taught anywhere so i think it should be fixed that this in this situation you have to go thoroughly and you should know what you can do in these situations and i think this can be a uh, thought through all the uh, simulation labs if not patient's per- perspective maybe it's simulation lab until fourth year final year and then in the internship uh, students can see actually what uh, patients require how the communication skills actually work and That's... communication skills are very important part what i feel it yeah. most of us most of us don't even know how to communicate the patient how to go about uh, what the patient requires actually uh, what the patient complaining of we just see the lab reports just get the patient bring to the mri section or we all do these things i think this is lacking here and uh, what i have always i'm not a brilliant student to be very honest but i think internship has improved me so far as a doctor this i feel uh thank you rashmi for being so forthright and uh, let me confess uh, to you as well i i also learned most of my medicine only during internship because uh, when we finish the exams you then you suddenly realize oh god from next year i'm supposed to actually be a doctor i mean people's lives may be dependent on me so then i i really plunged into my inter- i was not a very very studious uh, student if you could say uh, but i really plunged into my internship to the extent that everyone thought that i was going to take up that specialty this oh you are you are doing so much in gynae so you want gynae pg is it so that's how i learned by really so i i am glad that even after 30 40 years that is still true that internship is what rounds you up and i also agree with uh, dr karte i did not prepare at all for my entrance examination and it's thanks to my teachers who taught for the four and a half years and that one year of internship where i was you know uh thought at the bedside is how i wrote my entrance and got the seat so i'm i thought it was uh, not possible anymore but uh, it's good to know that it's possible even today so we have dr uh, balasubramanian waiting for a long time he uh, we like your uh, input sir dr balasubramanian so you are muted sir yeah am i visible and audible yes sir thank you for giving me an opportunity to join this forum uh i have a small update humble update before i uh make a few uh, points uh i have met you all a few months back subsequently i have retired from my parent institution st john's medical college after a 36 year uh, batting schedule there i have moved on to kmch medical college kovai i continue my services as professor of anatomy uh i do not have any professional degrees Uh, to prove my achievements in the field of uh, uh, medical education except uh, what is prescribed by the medical council of india but my passion has been digital medical education and in the context of what dr elangovan presented i have a few thoughts which may be at variance from the general feeling i think there are four elements involved in the uh, process called the medical education the system one is me the teacher second the institution that supports me third the university that affiliates the institution and five in this and fourth in this particular instance the it industry that can enable uh, a new dimension in medical education of these four because of shortage of time i would like to address item number 1 that is myself and item number 4 that is the it industry because these are the two domains where i can talk with confidence among other things first thing i i take the responsibility that if there has been any deficiency in medical education it is not always that the student is not interested it is also equally possible that we also need to improve one one point where i have worked to improve myself is i realized as was pro- pre- told by the previous uh, 
uh, opinion makers that simply giving a didactic lecture is not worth it. Although we do continue to do it, I have switched over from giving a didactic lecture to give an analytical exposure of the subject in a clinical scenario. What do I mean by this? I take the same number of lectures as I was taking in my earlier years. Only difference is if the student is seeking knowledge from me, he need not attend my theory class because all my lectures are already canned and is available on my YouTube channel. He, I give the link much in advance. In other words, I am a practitioner of the Khan Academy model. This is at a personal level. I do not influence others. I do not force anybody to take this, but I have found tremendous success and a high level of personal satisfaction in contributing to an improvement in the system. What do I do then in the theory class? Whatever algorithms Dr. Ilango mentioned in the context of my subject, I create scenarios and present it to my students and try to edge them towards uh, you know, working towards a decision making. I asked them, you, you see, what do you think this could be? Could that be anything like an arhernia or do you think that is a cyst? At whatever is the level of understanding at a first MBBS level, I try to prod my students to take a decision. With a cautious note that I tell them, making a mistake is your legitimate right as a student. But don't do that in the exam. When you have time to learn, even if you're wrong, doesn't matter. If you are willing to take a decision and commit a diagnosis or an identification or something, I will still call you a better doctor than somebody who simply sits there. I think my, my way of looking at it helps in creating decision-taking doctors rather than exam-going students. This is one aspect. Second and the third, that is institution and uh, uh, the university. I would like to refrain from making any comments because all my thoughts and ideas of the 36 years has been a total failure. I did not get sufficient support from these two uh, uh, entities. I, nevertheless, I want to be loyal to the system and the country. I do not want to make any comments uh, which are a derogatory. The last item is the enabler, namely the technology persons. The technology people are waiting to help the medical profession, but there are not many takers. Why I say this because uh, even at a very simple level, whatever Dr. Ilongo mentioned and presented in this lovely talk is available in its uh, uh, various avatars in a, a very popular uh, open source software, namely uh, Moodle. Earlier, Moodle was a very big thing, although it was open source and free, practicing Moodle was a big task because there was a large learning curve. Today, it is not so, primarily because there are a number of Moodle service vendors. Now, the service vendors are subletting the time and space to individual doctors, and they are giving entire coverage of financial support, time support, billing support, etc., so that all that a doctor like Dr. Ilangovan has to do is keep his battery of uh, algorithms ready go to the software company. He need not even enter it. Give it to them. They will enter it for you and they will launch it. And you can go on experimenting with your thing. And over a period of time, you can fine tune this uh, software. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is we are, we are ready to move into the arena of uh, big time utilization of learning management systems. I also have the fortune to have used Thanks to the institutional support I had at St. John's, I have worked in Open edX and another software, another LMS called the um, Tufts. Now, these have collectively, Moodle, Tufts, and this, have collectively 80% of the atmosphere that uh, Dr. Elango presented. And with a very low budget and with an excellent IT support, my humble uh, request to each of you teachers is, at least you can make a beginning at a personal level. Over a period of time, university will catch up, institution will catch up. Thank you for the patient hearing.
Uh, thank you, Dr. Balasubramaniam. Uh, we have Dr. Anand Bharadhan, who, who may have some contrarian views, uh, maybe answering the first question that Dilango put up in the beginning of his talk. Uh, uh, we'd like to hear from you, Dr. Anand. Anand Bharadhan? Ma'am, uh, thank you for asking me. I didn't plan to uh, tell anything here because I, I principally came to listen to what is happening and what your thoughts are. Uh, but then uh, through this thing, what uh, I'm a surgeon uh, uh, and uh, who was once a student. So uh, uh, I could tell that uh, where I got more, most inspired to learn and to, uh, and to continue to learn was when my teachers were selfless, when my teachers did not do private practice uh, at the higher education level when I was in Hyderabad in training in a government institution where there was no private practice. My teachers all the time taught about either treating patients or teaching us. So when, when we saw such people who were walking the talk, we automatically got inspired. So I think uh, for, a, for a person like me, what gave the most inspiration was somebody who was a selfless teacher, who was very compassionate, who had the time to show empathy, who had the time to tell us that learning is an everyday process and it's okay to make mistakes and, it, and that you can come back to me when you make a mistake and to keep driving the learning in a way which is very open, not in a very constrained uh, fact learning process, but as some uh, place the patient at the center of the learning. How am I going to help this patient live a better life was the question. There was never a question in my training of how am I going to learn a particular fact well or do a particular operation well? So that empathy was inculcated to me by selfless teachers in a government institution where private practice was not allowed. So I think I carried it forward and I practiced the same uh, at this point of time. I'm not a government doctor anyway, because I had my misgivings about uh, and uh, opportunities not to work in government. But this is something which, uh, which influenced my uh, thought. So, uh, so I think that is one key element which I see missing in India, where most people could actually uh, work in government hospitals, and uh, but um, uh, but are uh, unfortunately having a private practice, not dedicating full time to teaching. And I think that is making a whole lot of us not learn from our teachers well. Uh, that is one thing that went through my mind. The second thing I'll be very brief is that we have a system of difference. Uh, a system where medical education and medical services are totally different. At least in Tamil Nadu, uh, there are district hospitals where no teaching happens. It's only service uh, provided by surgeons and physicians. Whereas these can be the uh, these can be potential places where we could actually train uh, either undergrads or even postgraduate students to actually see what's happening on the ground, rather than showing them a tertiary hospital where most things are ideal where most things are, uh, are in place, systems are in place. Uh, whereas in a teaching hospital, which is going to be the, which is going in a, a district hospital, which is going to be the real life scenario for these patients, for these doctors, these doctors are hardly exposed. If they are exposed to the realities of a district hospital at a postgrad level, or even in a super specialty level, we could make our training much better. We'll make people understand that this is the reality in India. Do not compare yourself with training in England or training in US, where things are totally different. I mean, we are we are certainly a much poorer nation. We need to learn to work with less resources, and we need to pay, place the patient in the center rather than doing liver transplantation or robotic surgery. We just need to do a hernia operation well and send the patient home second day home with an open hernia operation. I mean, change the idea of training. We are producing more super specialists who are superfluous and not of much use to majority of the country. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, uh, Puneet, uh, over to you. I think uh, a very, very uh, lucidly put and a lot of thought-provoking things, uh, Ilango. I really uh, enjoyed it. I didn't realize uh, that it, Marrow was part of, you know, when my son was studying for the PG entrance, I found the Marrow, uh, the, you know, the thing that you uh, showed those three columns. I really love that because uh, I never found any, um, you know, MCQ help book uh, so so uh, complete, if you like. You know, um, I, I I must say almost shame, shamelessly that uh, I've always advised the students to 
uh, do the MCQs before they learn up. And most of them say, you know, we must know something before. I said, if you need to pass the exams, you need to do it. And I think that's where we are all wrong, that we are pushing them for the exams rather than. So that's one bit is, uh, you know, what Anand is trying to point, he's trying to make is that we need more uh, empathetic, passionate doctors. And I think medical humanity is a huge bridge. Uh, getting all this TNM, everything is now at the drop of a hat. So anybody who needs to do that uh, discriminatory thing, I think will have access to uh, net and the books. So I think instead of fact pushing, we really need to change the uh, stuff that we want, want out of them. So uh, I think what you said is fantastic for PG teaching because you know going in depth, uh, I saw my son reading about 15 systems of classification of biliary injuries, which I didn't, you know, I knew three. Uh, I, and then I see no point why they need to know all those which they're never going to use. And this was my dissertation. I didn't know that. So, you know, and I, I can bet that, you know, one year down the line, he has no clue of recollection of any of them. So genuine long term is not that one year till the next uh, MLE exam or whatever. It's the it's the in the application. And I think that's where we uh, we don't teach them. Like I really feel train the trainers is going to be the most tough because in surgery particularly, uh, uh, note you know we have such a pompous hierarchical system that we don't want to accept that we don't know. I've I've rarely found senior you know uh, the senior most people actually they're better at that in saying that I don't know why this uh, you know everybody goes to bedside and so that uh, saying that this is the reason for your symptoms. Instead of saying, we don't know why we are there, we think it is this, you know, when the student sees that, he realizes he shouldn't feel guilty about not knowing. He sees these uh, fancy superstars who know seem to know everything, which may or may not be correct. Uh, and, you know, I think it perpetrates some bit of that, uh, you know, a bit of, what should I say, not the correct uh, way to do things. So I think Subhashish also said that, uh, uh, some very valid points he made in the in the comments also. And um, I don't know, um, I think this uh, very thought provoking, I think we need to do more sessions, Dr. Vidya, because I think uh, if we need to change a lot of stuff has to come from outside the governmental system. There's huge, like somebody pointed out, there's a huge wealth of talent, which our caste system of teachers and non-teachers has, you know, completely ostracized out of that uh, reserve, de-reserved them into the periphery. So I think we need to tap into that talent and instead of the national, uh, you know, the uh, medical council uh, uh, delimit how the Aadhaar based system has to come in and all that uh, kind of stuff. What we need to concentrate is how to get more, not have five teachers in anatomy. Uh, you can have only one, uh, uh, you know, genuine anatomy uh, person and five uh, surgeons or, you know, ENT people or something who teach that particular subject and, you know, increase the pool of people who we need. And finally, I think it's the the first uh, point uh, in Langu said is how do we uh, reach out to the entire population? I think that is one question we are not answering. As somebody said very rightly, uh, one of the seniors uh, earlier, that we are making super specialists. Every MS graduate I see is just a pre-MCH program. He's not even training himself in surgery or the, uh, or the medicine, the internal medicine. So I think we need to change that. And the only way I see is we need a two-tiered system where we need, you know, um, we are never going to get a physician assistant program or a nurse practitioner program acceptable to the pompous Indian mind. So I think we have to have a two-tiered where you have a basic and a honors degree, if you like, which will be for, you know, pushing research down every teacher and all is also nonsense. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll ever achieve that. So I think we need a two-tiered system to reach the uh, the specialists and the, t and the teachers uh, and one for the basic, uh, uh, you know, uh, medical needs of the country, uh, rural doctors and all that. Thank you. Thanks, Puneet. Uh, Ravi has his hand up forever. Uh, sorry for uh, not coming to you sooner, Ravi. Uh, over to you. Oh, no, no worries. I was uh, um, listening. The, uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Ilango for a wonderful session and also um, sort of um, 
helping me understand that doctors can also code and um, you know come up with programs. I've always been in awe of people like that. And so Ilango, I'm really, um, I'm gonna uh, reach out to you um, outside uh, of this uh, meeting to uh, you know talk to you about some of those things. One thing that I do, uh, that I wanted to make, and this might be um, sort of something that Dr. Kate had already said, but the point is that we're trying to separate out these things of, you know, exam taking skills versus being a good doctor. Shouldn't they both be the same? Shouldn't your exams test you on your ability to be a good doctor? Well, that's what I, I mean, I'm also an undergraduate from JIPMA, so I did not prepare specifically for any of the postgraduate uh, exams, including um, the PGI entrance exam, which I finally did get into, but it was all about using what I learned in JIPMA to answer these questions. It was not about any special training. And, but I have to tell you that when I took those um, a, a, a entrance exams, there was a whole cadre of pay people who talked about the number of bits they had um, you know, memorized or practiced on or whatever. These were these practice questions. And frankly, I had no idea what they were talking about at that point in time, but it didn't make any difference. I mean, we certainly, um, I mean, Amit uh, Ghosh can also attest, we were certainly better than most of those bits people, but, which is basically the point that I'm trying to make is that these need to be the same. Uh, but I would like to uh, end on a question to Ilango, which I'd already posted as well, which is basically, how do you look at a, pa uh, uh, not a patient, how do you look at a student and predict their decision-making skills versus their ability to learn skills? Because I think these are two separate um, aspects. And if you identify what the student can do naturally and what they need help in, that might also help individualizing um, education. So uh, Ilanga has a host of uh, questions he will need to answer. So before that, one final uh, thing, uh, Professor Rajaram has been logged in right from the beginning. He has also been uh, a teacher to generation of uh, students. So I'd like to hear from him and then Ilango, I hope you have all the questions lined out. People are yeah, your uh, th Thank you, Vidya. Thank you very much. I think Vidya has been very kind asking me to speak something about it. Now, though most of you think that I'm an old timer, but I'm an old timer with a modern thinking that I appreciated Ilango's lecture very well, very well. But unfortunately, I have to disagree with him that how the it has to be implemented practically. That is very difficult. I think Amit has summarized very well and Ilango's uh, point of view is taken very well. And the last speaker has said that it, we must try to implement that. But let me tell you, sir, that we need to teach the teachers how to train the students. That is very important. Now, I, 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 I introduced a lot of things which I learned from others and from elsewhere in JIPMAR. And I'm glad that some of the, my students did like my way of teaching and training. Now, for example, uh, Dr. Balasubhanam was talking about anatomy dissection all. I was the first clinician who took students to the anatomy dissection hall before I did a Vardhan hysterectomy or a Shauta hysterectomy, where I invited some of the undergraduate students also to learn. And then the undergraduate students, I tried to hold their hands and, and teach them how to do an episiotomy. Now, Dr. Ilongo did not like obstetrics and gynecology when he was a student, but definitely he liked it now giving examples mostly from the obstetrics and gynecology. Ilongo, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. Oh, so <laughs> I'm talking about this. So therefore, uh, there's nothing much to add because a lot of things have been discussed and I totally agree with all the things. The only thing that I wanted to talk to you is that about taking the students to the district hospitals and taking the students to the camps is very important, which I did, right? For more than 30, 40 years, I've been doing that. And I was the one person who suggested to the government of India when I was deputy director general and in charge of the medical education of the whole country, that district hospitals must be, the medical colleges must be attached to district hospitals so that they can go to the district hospital. But fortunately, now they are implementing that. Now, for example, in Telangana, over a push of a button, 13 medical colleges were started. 
in district, but without realizing that there is no staff, there are no teachers, no trained people are available. So I wish they have taken that. And one hint to Vidya is next time when you are doing something about medical education, please invite a couple of uh, politicians too. For example, this uh, KTR in uh, in uh, Hyderabad is a very highly educated fellow in uh, in India as well as in America, so that they can implement in their in their decisions of how to train and teach the students. And lastly. I think it is time for us to review again the Flexnar committee report and the board's committee report. Flexnar about more than hundred years ago gave the government of uh, USA the same situation that is existing today. And board committee about 15 years ago said how to teach and train the students. These things we are missing, the politicians have missed, the doctors have missed, the teachers have missed. So I think it's time that we should go into the attack again and see how it matches now. Now, therefore, my principle is that a teacher is one who always learns and learns and learns only to teach, to learn. Thank you very much, Vidya, for inviting me. Thank you, sir. The, the floor is all yours, uh, Ilango. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So the, the first one was um, um, some of the uh, basic foundation of my work came from listening to lectures in marvelous medicine. So part of the work that I started doing was just listening to lectures in marvelous medicine. I wanted to start that uh, where. So simulated environments, initially we, um, I worked on this when I was in uh, UPMC of how to train to do a hepatic vein anastomosis in a critical circumstance. So that was a simulated environment and I wanted to create a low cost simulation environment. That's a skill-based training. So now my primary work is to create a simulated environment for good medical decision-making. That's the primary goal, okay? So um, um, honestly, I really wanted to work on this uh, reductionist view, uh, Professor Gosh, um, but I still believe that the ideal point is ability to make decisions with incomplete information. That incomplete information needs the student to learn the complete information first. So that is the place where I am in. But ultimately, what where we want to do is the software should generate enough clinical scenarios with incomplete information for them to actually make. So the software now can develop 5.9, 5.8, uh, which, which is clinically applicable. So that incomplete information we can work with. In time information, uh, there's some phone which is disturbing. Can we mute all? Um, Radha Krishna? Yeah. So thank you, thank you, sir. In time uh, information, in time information, uh, also requires proper sequencing. So initially we wanted to provide in-time calculators. So handheld devices like mobile phones to use to provide bedside calculators. That was one of our early works. So uh, uh, it's, it's still ongoing. It's very difficult to integrate into a virtual training environment, but this is very much possible. The, the third one, what I wanted to do was enough repetition. I think this was Rashmi's point. There are clinical scenarios uh, which we see on a daily basis, which gets into our long-term memory. So we invariably work on a simple algorithm so that our brains can remember a pathway. So we can simulate enough number of repetitions using a software environment, any kind of clinical scenario. I mean, suppose you want to be trained in rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease management. It is possible because we can create the individual components of a clinical scenario and then present it first in an initially complete picture and then in an incomplete picture. So that is something which I really wanted to do. The software which you actually saw on the screen uh, has a different story to it. It is not narrow. Um, when the Ukrainian students came, came to India and some of them were really lost, we had a couple of uh, CIS trained uh, interns working in Miyot Hospital. Uh, 
I didn't know the cost of those softwares at that time. I think it cost close to 50,000, 60,000 rupees. None of those students could afford. I, my heart really went out to them. So the software which you actually saw is called Cubase, which is just 500 rupees um, per month. And uh, the original idea was so that every student can actually afford. I mean, we cannot discriminate students based on their affordability. So the, the actual question software which you got pulled up is actually Cubase, which is, uh, which is quite, uh, quite a cheap platform for them to practice. I had some incentive to uh, drive down the, the academic portion of that, but uh, we wanted to keep the costs low so that they can uh, do it on their own. Um, the uh, Dr. Ravi's point, so real life scenarios, uh, real life scenarios also can be done. Um, um, right now we are working on the obstetrics part, but um, the ATLS simulation training is also possible. There is some bit of groundwork that you have to do before that. You can really do that. The training can be actually, I and mean, we don't have the virtual images like how NEGM is able to do, it's very expensive. Creation of a simple virtual training platform costed me about roughly 12.5 lakhs for the base. And then for maintenance cost between 2.5 to 4 lakhs per month. So it's, it's not a very easy thing to do, I learned. The, um, for answering Dr. Ravi's question, I do not want to distinguish between students. There are students of different skills uh, who enter medical schools. One of the um, most beautiful aspects of our profession is diversity. The, the more diverse the students are, the thinking process will actually click in more uh, future, uh, what do you call, discoveries, research, modalities of treatment or something like that. So I want to be all inclusive. That's, that's, that's how uh, I wanted the students who cannot afford, uh, we created a software platform for them to write the exams. So decision-making skills is very much possible in the software environment, but learning skills, sorry, Patasar, again, I think there is disturbance. Uh, Ilango, your mic is muted. You need to for, for unmute yourself. These are software is very good for helping people learn decisions and make them good basic doctors. So I, I was driving all the way because we need to provide a safe, effective doctor in a needy situation. Uh, the clinical scenario in which he is going to work is going to be maybe very poor. To inculcate that habit, it's very difficult for the students to accept that uh, uh, learning these things are important. That was the challenge for us. Those students, we put them into a, a, a scenario in which it will be helpful for them to learn for the exams as well. But the actual truth is that all the information that is given is basically taken out of ACOGs, Green Top Guidelines, and um, ATLS, proper textbooks, proper algorithms, what is effectively I have used in clinical practice and what I feel is very much necessary in uh, in day-to-day in, in, uh, -day management. So uh, decision-making skills is teachable. Skills, learning actual skills to deliver that, that is a gap. But I think a lot of other people are working on it in simulated environments. I also do some work on vascular surgery teaching in that. So it is possible. The, the the idea is to create a doctor whose skill level we have not defined yet. If we define them very clearly, we can say, okay, the guy who passes this is capable of independent practice. That we have not defined, but at least we can do you know, see things like protecting airways, putting a tracheostomy or a cricothyroidotomy, putting an ICD, just putting a needle, putting a needle decompression of a tension pneumothorax after proper identification. They're all life-saving skills. So which I, and for hyperkalemia, things like that. Those are important things. When I initially taught people how to decide hyperkalemia and identify ECGs using the same software which you saw on the display, it looked like a joke for most of them, but they are really life-saving skills. But, but 
they did not use it. That that hyperkalemia module was never used, except when I forced them to use it. The students or the junior doctors never saw the importance of learning about hyperkalemia, how it can save the life of one of their own in the future. So that is a uh, uh, question for which I have no answer. But the software can be done, the virtual environment can be done, and whatever we wish to teach can be done. Decision making, factual learning, everything can be done. What I have tried to do it is to make it affordable, also in a in a way uh, in a way that really there are some really poor students when they came and told that they are not able to afford. I said you don't need it. You actually were taught everything in MBBS, uh, but their heart does not accept that. So to help them cope with that, and for some of the students who came from uh, the Central Asian Training Institutes, we wanted to really give them something which they can really afford. So that, that was the thing. Uh, I see Puneet's comment on French Index. French yeah, Index, uh, I got the new one. Uh, uh, many of you have mentioned uh, about uh, simulation and passing, including Ilango just now. So uh, Tilaka, are you still logged in? You want to add something? We have a few minutes because today we planned a little longer session. Tilaka, are you logged in? Okay, maybe not. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, Tilaka is there. Yeah, just. Uh, I don't know. <coughs> so, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, if, if, she, uh, if she's there, she will uh, raise her hand. Yeah. Oh, there she Mom, Mom, I, I, I am here. I'm sorry for a brief minute. Uh, I got uh, disconnected. We can't see you, Tilaka. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, slightly <laughs> not in a position where I can switch on the camera. But I truly can't appreciate the fact uh, that this topic was first chosen and so much was discussed and so many things were uh, told about uh, the entire thing. Uh, I, I kind of got disconnected in between, so I don't know if this is a repetition. Pardon me if it is. But one thing that always bothers is... Uh, of course, great teachers can only produce great students. So that is very obvious with all these discussions. All institutions are called teaching institutions. But what do these teaching institutions do to honor those who really want to teach? So that is also something that uh, probably needs uh, uh, um, some, everybody needs some recognition and when somebody is going out of the way to do something, for instance, somebody wants to do uh, decision making, team training, good attitude, apart from knowledge and skills in simulation, that requires a lot of work, that requires a lot of training, that requires a lot of dedication, but how do we recognize these teachers? So, uh, uh, in my opinion, I think if we start recognizing these teachers and uh, uh, start um, uh, kind of uh, uh, encouraging them, everything will change positively. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity, ma'am. So, uh, back to you, Ghosh. Uh, yeah, um, wonderful discussion. Um, I just need to highlight a couple of points which Dr. Sabina Nandi said and um, Dr. Ilango Setu said is the democratization of teaching. And this goes to what Dr. Rashmi said. The brilliant students are probably 10%. They will do well with us, without, without us. But the responsibility for an institution and the teacher is to find out what they can do to the 90% who are far better than so many others who could get into medical school to make them capable doctors. Uh, so the challenge is not to take a student who's getting a 4.0 or A student and, and live well. That, that's easy task. So that is where all these different uh, kind of things, the simulation, the reputation, the fading, the new, new theories of adult learning, going to the district level, like Dr. Rajaram is saying, somebody with that gravitas, somebody with that challenge uh, to improve education, that's absolutely vital. The second thing is uh, what um, the last speaker said is how do we honor teachers? When I was finishing my last day in PGI Chandigarh, one of our very esteemed cardiology teachers met me and said, Amit, promise me that you will never be a medical educator in your life. 
And I said, why do you say, sir? And you've taught all of us cardiology. He says, nobody respects us when they graduate. Nobody even says hello or good morning or whatever. So this is sometimes the state of the great teachers in India and everywhere else. But to disappoint him, I became a medical educator. I'm a distinguished medical educator, which is the top form of educate, educator award given in the Mayo Clinic, because I have passion for it, like Dr. Setu. I strongly believe that as educators, we have to stop being static in where we are, what our roles are, go beyond our institutions, deal with the frustrations, which we heard this uh, professor from St. John talk about, uh, because it's a much more bigger thing than just an institution. You are in a very unique situation to influence education, to influence the next level of doctors, to influence a whole range of people who are going to take care of you and your family much after you're gone uh, and your term is done. So it's a very sacred honor. Uh, that's what um, these kind of dialogues and meetings are, are work in progress kind of a thing. Is it is the best thing I've heard? Yes. Uh, is it will solve our problem? No. Can every, every institution in India do it? Absolutely no. Uh, but people are excited, yes. And that excitement is what carries through. And someday, when you keep knocking the wall, knocking the wall with doctors like Setu and all the professors here, you get moving, the needle moves slowly, slowly, but it happens. But if you can, as an educator, motivate your student for a different way of learning, a different way of changing their system, not being uh, put into the great system and saying, this is like uh, my birth, like I'm this caste or that caste. Uh, no, you are a doctor and you have huge responsibility. The sky is the limit. That kind of hope, if you can give us educators, we have done the job. And in my experience, I have taken taught thousands of students and I can tell you like students like uh, Dr. Rashmi and others who have that kind of mindset to help the patient understand, move the needle, are the future leaders. They are the health ministers. They are the professors. They are going to be the movers and shakers because they stand to gain by standing up and saying what's right and what's not right. And, and those are the kind of individuals who immediately in the long run may not get a good grade uh, or have a certificate which shows this and that. But in the long run, they are the champions and people remember them. Uh, they are the doctors who people discuss in all their uh, dinner meetings when the family gathers together in holidays that this doctor saved me and that doctor is a great doctor. Why don't you see it? Nobody talks about where you passed your MBBS from. Nobody t talks about what grade you got or what your NET rank was. But to get that student to that level, you need a prolific teacher who despite all the odds, salary restrictions, promotion restrictions, uh, restrictions placed by the universities and institution to rise up to the channel and like be like the Cambridge doctors, which uh, Dr. Samiran Nandi said, allow a student to think, be a lifelong learner, uh, go outside their comfort box, uh, completely dump things that they've learned and take a whole new different way of changing the system. Uh, to be that change agent, which Marvelous Medicine has become a change agent of great sorts. So with that, I would hand it over to Vidya. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, thank you, Ilango, for uh, getting us um, started. I, so uh, Radha Krishna, would you like to announce about the new series we are planning? Uh, <clears throat> I think a great uh, two hours, yeah. I should say that uh, uh, Ilango, as usual, is a breath of fresh air, and he set the ball rolling uh, right uh, for this discussion. And uh, it's a pleasure to have so many luminaries and you know, very wonderful comments today. Uh, of course, you can see the zeal and enthusiasm of uh, pedagogy in Ilango. Uh, all the sum of what he talks goes above my head, and he's one uh, of this uh, tech savvy person, and he's into you know. Uh, softwares in uh, making education better. I wish uh, there are more people from the government sector, uh, more than Dr. Damodaran and uh, Dr. Kate, who've been invited, uh, who, who will be audience to this to understand what we are talking about. Because I, I'll, I dream of a day when wireless medicine becomes a curriculum in all the medical schools in India. And they're forced to listen to this because there's so much mm -hmm. talk and uh, so much, uh, um, you know, uh, 
not known all over. And as uh, uh, Puneet rightly says, there's a, a wealth of uh, right-minded people in the non-government sector, non-teaching sector. I think we have to tap into their talent and uh, you know make this program a great success. I think we. I mean, uh, I was uh, discussing with Puneet in. Uh, Mm, Ahmedabad just a couple of days ago that you know we need to take this thing further of uh, focus and pedagogy I mean of course it's a bit controversial here and there but it'd be nice if you have more people from the government sector to come in and uh, talk about it and we had more students from local colleges also you know to get involved and uh, work on it and actually at what uh, Dr. Um, Kate rightly says I think what all we have learned and what all I practice even today, every day is what I learned in Jipma Pondicherry and nowhere else. You know, I think uh, that connect is a very special connect. And I think sometime we have to talk about yeah. that connect and uh, what has happened to it or is it still there or has it got diluted? I think these are very sentimental things we, we, we talk about. I think uh, Ilango, you should come up with some software, you know, uh, to help in that area as well. And uh, Tilaka is the right person to help you out in that because, you know, that human touch the, uh, in, in the understanding and, uh, you know, uh, these are all subtle things which we need to uh, infuse into our uh, system. I think everybody is, you know, um, sort of uh, contributed. Every person who commented today has contributed a point or two. I hope Pilongo will take it down all together and, you know, we'll sit together and we'll, you know, put them into the future program that are going to come in and, sure, sir. <coughs> to make it uh, <coughs> sorry, a successful one. Yeah, so I'm 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 going to hand over the baton to uh, Ilago and Puneet to take this uh, uh, part on pedagogy forward. And we'll probably have one session every month or uh, once in six weeks or eight weeks, depending on how things uh, pan out. And uh, I thank everyone who logged in today, despite their busy schedules and uh, uh, contributed so actively to uh, the discussion. I don't think we've had so much discussion in a long time and so many people participating both in the chat box and uh, uh, and speaking up. Um, so thank you, everybody. And uh, sorry to keep you for so long today. Uh, we'll uh, meet uh, next week with uh, yet another episode of Marvelous Medicine. Uh, till then, take care and stay safe. Uh, good night. Thank you. Bye, Thank bye. you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, we miss Nala. We miss Nala's words. <laughs> A last word to say anything? Nala, you're muted. Nala, you're muted. Get back. Uh, I, I, I just want to say I'm proud to be an anesthetist. <laughs> and teaching and learning has been very comfortable in anesthesia. So I don't know you surgeons. <laughs> we are a different gang and we have always been teaching and learning all our life. I am proud of it. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you, Vidya. <laughs> She'll agree. <laughs> bye, bye. Take Lovely. Care. Bye. <laughs>